Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Throughout antiquity, Thucydides was considered the greatest historian and the one most worthy of emulation. In the opinion of the ancients, he had managed to compose a work that for technical virtuosity, moral point, and emotional impact rivaled the greatest monuments of poetry and prose. What Homer was to epic, Demosthenes to oratory, Plato to philosophy, Thucydides was to history. Such was the power of his spell that when Dionysius of Halicarnassus came to treat Thucydides' work as a literary effort, he had to apologize even for suggesting that certain elements in the work could be improved. Thucydides' reputation has been similarly brilliant in the modern age. The 19th century, for instance, certain that a scientific history was available and attainable by a careful examination of facts and a keen distillation of history's lessons and rules, believed that it had found in Thucydides a kindred spirit, a man equally committed to the search for truth and the rigorous exclusion of the fantastic and trivial. Jacobi thought that Thucydides achieved the perfect balance of empiricism and artistic perfection, but the latter was not thought in any way to compromise the former. Amidst the sensational and credulous historians that were all too common amongst his followers, he stood out as a brilliant exception, rising above the petty prejudices and politics of his time, and surveying with Olympian detachment and judgment the doings of individuals and states, all the while dissecting with acuity and impartiality the true and underlying causes of human actions, fully justifying his own claim that he had written a work for all time. Now, it would be wrong to say that this view has completely vanished, but the last 50 years have seen a rather different focus on the historian, and the belief that Thucydides is not our colleague, as one scholar has put it, is now as common as its opposite was once held. To be sure, there remain many scholars who would disavow the new picture of Thucydides that has emerged. But increasingly, it has come to be seen that Thucydides, while superior in some ways to his fellow historians from antiquity, nevertheless, and not surprisingly, shares many of their characteristics. Scholars have explored the writer's place in the intellectual and social milieu of 5th century Greece, the influence of contemporary attitudes and concerns, the underlying narrative and rhetorical structure of his work, the thematic patterning imposed by the writer on his narrative, the associations with epic and tragedy, and the author's omissions and errors. Here as elsewhere, a tension is visible between those who claim a primary place for the rhetorical and compositional element, and those who while acknowledging the literary artistry of Thucydides, nevertheless maintain that this does not comp compromise the historical veracity or reliability of the author. Wherever one stands on this issue, here as elsewhere, depends entire, ultimately on the way in which one views the relationship between literary form and factual reporting in narrative history. What little we know of the life of Thucydides comes from his own writings. Uh, an ancient biography by one Marcellinus does survive, but it is the usual mixture of anecdote and stylistic analysis uh, with a good deal of inference from Thucydides' own text and cannot be used with any confidence. Thucydides himself was spare in his information about himself, telling us only that he began writing his account at the outbreak of the war that he was of a sufficient age to understand it when it broke out. Scholars have generally assumed that he was born between 460 and 455, that he suffered from the Great Plague in 429, that he had mining interests and political influence in Thrace, that he was exiled for 20 years after his generalship in 424, presumably, uh, though he himself does not say this explicitly, for his failure to save the city of Amphipolis from being captured by the Spartan commander Brasidas, and that his exile afforded him the opportunity to travel at leisure amongst the participants in the war, especially the Spartans. We also 
understand from his writings that he lived throughout the whole of the war, he tells us this. His father's name was Olorus, and his Thracian connections suggest that he was related to Chimon, whose grandfather was also named Olorus, and to Pericles' opponent, Thucydides, the son of Milesius. The mining interests indicate that he was most likely a wealthy man with sufficient leisure and capability for travel. And although we may assume that as a member of a conservative aristocratic family, he shared some of the viewpoints and beliefs of his class, his praise of Pericles in Book 2, Chapter 65, suggests that we must not underestimate the independence of his judgment. At what date he died is uncertain, although it is usually assumed that he that the unfinished state of his work indicates that he did not live long after the end of the war. Thucydides is thus the first contemporary historian of whom we know, and this afforded him opportunities such as had not before existed, namely the ability not only to be present at great actions, but also to learn of them, sometimes soon after their completion from others who were. It is generally assumed that the main sources for his account were his own presence at events and reports he received from other eyewitnesses. Thucydides does not name his sources, although scholars have proposed both Brasidas, that Spartan I just mentioned, and the Athenian Alcibiades, among others, although these may have suggested themselves largely because of the narrative prominence accorded to each man. Except for a few incidents, it is unlikely that he had any written sources from which to work, especially if, as he himself says, he began work on the history at the outbreak of the war. This reliance, therefore, on contemporary witnesses has usually won acceptance for the narrative of actions, but it may be worth noting that eyewitness accounts were suspect even in antiquity, and modern research suggests that they are not particularly reliable, especially when witnesses are recalling traumatic incidents. As with Herodotus, we are uncertain of the way in which Thucydides' work was made known to the public or indeed whether any or all of it was known in the author's lifetime. Whereas Herodotus's work bears what seem unmistakable signs of oral composition and performance, the dense and abstract nature of Thucydides' work suggests a reading audience, and this is thought to be supported by his remarks in Book 1, Chapter 22, where he contrasts his own work with that of his predecessors and disavows, quote, the storytelling element and the striving for pleasure. Yet the dividing line between spoken and written and the certain assignation of Thucydides' work to the latter can be somewhat overdrawn. Thucydides' own remark that his work may seem less pleasurable estein akroasin to the hearing suggests that this is in fact how he expected it to be promulgated. And it is possible, too, that just as in Herodotus, so too in Thucydides, there are certainly display pieces, such as the account of the plague in Book 2, chapters 47 through 54, or the Stasis, that is the civil strife in Corsaira, Book 3, chapter 82 through 85, which might have been delivered even before the work was completed. This does not preclude, of course, the probability that many would have learned of the text by reading it, nor, indeed, that Thucydides also conceived of his text as an object of study. Eschewing the narrative an uh, anachrony and sometimes anarchy of Herodotus's arrangement, Thucydides chose an analytic form for his contemporary history, following a strictly year-by-year -year arrangement, dividing the year by summer and winter, and detailing events by theater of operation within those seasonal subdivisions. In this area alone, Thucydides did not have a lasting influence. Dionysius of Halicarnassus, whom I've already mentioned, says that no one followed this arrangement. And although the statement is clearly exaggerated, since the uh, Hellenica Oxorincia, um, that is papyruses of later authors who have survived only in fragments, is similarly arranged, it is noteworthy that of surviving histories, only the first section of Xenophon's Hellenica followed the, the Thucydidean procedure of analytic or year-by-year -year accounts. 
No doubt the need to find a method of dating that was independent of Greek local calendars and a belief in the importance of establishing linear causal connections were paramount consideration in Thucydides's choice. Thucydides defined his topic narrowly. He xunegrapse, that is, he composed or wrote up the war of the Athenians and the Peloponnesians, how they fought with each other. He chose a single conflict that lasted many decades, but unlike Herodotus, he did not use the conflict as a starting point for wide-reaching investigations. Thucydides stays close to his topic. The work itself <coughs> may be divided into the following parts. After a long prelude, <coughs> which consists of the background to the actual conflicts themselves in Book One, Thucydides moves on to the events of the war. The narrative of the war's first ten years is of a uniform and highly polished nature, complete with lengthy speeches, that is, books two, chapters one, through book five, chapter 24. Uh, towards the end of this narrative, when discussing the peace negotiations, Thucydides included some verbatim documents concerning the establishment of the peace. This, for instance, can be found in book uh, four, chapters uh, 117 through book five, chapter 24. And this has led some to see this section as formally different. A section, a second preface appears at book five, chapter 26, reintroducing the author and arguing for the view that the conflict from 431 to 404 was a single war. That section is followed by a spare narrative of the years of the uneasy peace between the years 421 and 416, which lacks speeches and direct discourse, and again contains those verbatim documents that I've just mentioned, Book 5, Chapters 27 through 83. Beginning with the Athenian expedition against Milos in 415 and the Melian dialogue of Book 5, Chapters 84 through 116, the narrative again expands such that the Sicilian expedition, which comprised little more than two years, that is the years 415 to 413, receives the fullest and most detailed treatment in the entire work, that is entire, the entirety of books six and seven. That this section may have been conceived as an independent unit is suggested not only by the depth of treatment and the high level of polish in the narrative, but also by the formal introduction of Sicily at the beginning of Book Six, even though Sicily had been mentioned many times in the earlier narrative, containing its geography and a brief ethnography. Book Eight treats the years for twelve to, and part of four eleven, and has always been considered problematic because of its apparently unfinished condition manifested in the lack of speeches and direct discourse, the inclusion of documents and what some see as doublets, that is, sections that are repeated. Some recent scholarship, however, has taken a different tack and has sought to explain the peculiar nature of Book Eight in both narrative and historical terms. Thucydides, these scholars argue, was faced with the difficulty of beginning again after the magnificent and superlative actions of the Sicilian expedition, which he himself called quote, the greatest deed of this war, and it seems to me of all of Greek affairs that we know from report. That is Book 7, Chapter 87. At the same time, the final phase of the war now took a different turn, and the remaining years were not marked by any expedition or incident on the scale of Sicily. Instead, both sides maneuvered back and forth rather gingerly, lacking dominant leaders of the character of Pericles or Brasidas and unable to deliver a decisive blow to the other side. In this sense, the situation bore a distinct resemblance to the Peace of Nicias, which faces similar narrative difficulties. The one dominant personality, of course, was Alcibiades, and in his person, he represents exactly the narrative problems that Thucydides faced in a war that now changed venue and direction more than ever before. The storyline was no longer linear, you see, and teleological, nor did the expected actions materialize. The Sicilians did not join forces with the Spartans, nor did the Spartans press fully their advantage, uh, a dilatoriness of which the Corinthians had long before accused them. Rather than the destruction that seemed so imminent <clears throat> for the Athenians at the end of Book 7, 
we find instead the Athenians rebounding and against all odds holding out. As Sparta was forced to wage a naval war in the Aegean, the narrative of the great land power against the great sea power began to break down. And this was accompanied by the increased importance of Persia in Greek affairs, which added a third player of equal power to what had been a hitherto bipolar narrative. Awaiting the end, we find only a narrative of the deferment of expected resolution, as one scholar has put it. Unlike Herodotus, Thucydides was very reluctant to engage in digressions, and he tended to avoid material that did not fall under the category of the things done in the war, ta erga ton praxenton en to polemo. For that reason, the few places where he does allow himself to move from his stated subject matter are all the more noticeable. Earlier scholarship, in accord with its view of Thucydides as a historian with a passion for accuracy, had seen these incidents mainly as occasions for the author's correction of error on the part of others. More recently, however, scholars have suggested that these digressions are closely related to the thematic concerns of the history. The so-called archaeology of Book 1, chapters 2 through 20, in addition to being part of the magnification of the topic and a demonstration of the author's historical method, indicates those elements, that is, money and sea power, that are essential to Thucydides' view of the greatness of the Peloponnesian War. Similarly, the careers of Themistocles and Pausanias, which are adumbrated in Book 1, chapters 1, 28 through 38, have a significant resonance uh, with those of the leaders of the Peloponnesian War. A particularly striking digression is that on the Athenian, is, is that of the uh, on the Athenian tyrannicides within the narrative of the Sicilian expedition. Here, in a long excursus that seems very loosely attached to its surrounding context, Thucydides corrects the popular belief about Harmodius and Aristogiton, reducing the great achievement of the tyrannicides to a mere personal and inept reaction to an erotic slight. <clears throat> this is Book Six, Chapters Fifty Three through Fifty Nine. On the surface, nothing could seem farther from the subject at hand, yet there may be important thematic links with the surrounding narrative. Thucydides explicitly points to the demos during both this earlier incident and the mutilation of the Herm statues as frightened and capable of the most irrational behavior. In addition, the scholar Connor has pointed out how the eros of both the tyrannicides and the Athenian people is a motivating factor. In this sense, the tyrannicide digression picks up the theme of the relationship between the democracy and its leaders that was treated also in the Pausanias Themistocles digression. An earlier generation of scholars spent enormous energy in trying to determine the stages of Thucydides' composition, and it is understandable that this Thucydideshafaga, that is the Thucydidean question, was worthy of attention. If the conclusions turned out to be contradictory or incomplete, that was simply a result of the state of the evidence, for no one could prove a section of Thucydides early or late, except for the obvious places in which he refers to the end of the war. Yet it was reasonable, I think, when faced with this enormous and impressive work, to assume that the author had only gradually come to some of his views, and it was a challenge to see if one could locate the different viewpoints of the author. However, that question is all but dead today, and it is hard to imagine that any scholar can succeed where so many greats have tried and failed. More recent scholarship, as I say, in the last 50 years or so, has focused instead on the largely unified perspective of Thucydides' work and has turned most of its attention to explaining the articulation of the work as we have it. Indeed, what is remarkable about Thucydides' work is the way in which discrete and separate episodes are given unity <clears throat> by structural and thematic links with the other parts of the history. This is one of the important ways in which Thucydides is able to move beyond individual facts in order to bring out underlying patterns. I will deal with thematic connections later, but here it may be worthwhile to call attention to four unifying techniques in particular. <clears throat> 
juxtaposition, prefiguration and repetition, contrast and reversal, and the integration of speech and narrative. <clears throat> juxtaposition, characteristic also of tragedy, compels the reader to interpret single incidents in the light of others to which they are closely related. For example, Thucydides' description of the plague in Book 2, chapters 47 to 54, looked at in isolation as if simply a harrowing portrait of human suffering and the breakdown of society. Its ability to evoke pathos is not diminished by treating it as an independent incident, just as one might remove a choral ode from a tragedy and treat it as an autonomous piece, admiring its language and structure. But examined in context, the plague is the central element of a triptych framed by two speeches. One, the funeral oration of Pericles, an idealistic portrait of a timeless and harmonious Athens, book two, chapters 35 through 46. And the other is Pericles's last speech, that is book two, chapters 60 through 64, portraying the grim reality of the chance and suffering of war of the chasm between the ideal and the real, and between human aspirations and human achievement. Similarly, the juxtaposition of the Athenian decision on Mytilene with the Spartan decision on Plataea is rich in ironies as the tyrant city Athens relents after second thoughts, while the Spartan liberators refuse to reconsider the conduct of the Plataeans, asking them simply the same question that they had at the outset, and imposing a harsh punishment. One of the most powerful juxtapositions, the placement of the Melian dialogue immediately before the expansive narrative of the Sicilian expedition cannot be accidental, since both episodes are intimately concerned with the forceful expansion of Athens. With tragic irony, the final narrative of the destruction of the Athenian forces brings back resonant echoes of the words of the dialogue, having ordered the Melians not to rely on hope or some form of deliverance, but to look simply to present realities. The Athenians, within a very short time, find themselves reduced to extremes, relying on a divine justice and the enticements of hope and on an assistance that never appears. A second technique is that of prefiguration and repetition. <clears throat> the two are intimately connected. Since the very notion of a prefigurement suggests, of course, that something similar is going to reoccur. At the outset of the work, Thucydides' narrative of the archaeology prefigures the major themes of naval power, money, and preparedness, uh, that will loom so large in both the speeches and actions of the war. In addition, it also encapsulates the dynamism and instability of empire, not only noting its forward movement, but also anticipating its eventual decline. Later in Book One, the stories of Pausanias and Themistocles prefigure later characters and events. We are here introduced to the characteristics of the two major protagonists, Athens and Sparta, through their most famous men before the Peloponnesian War. More than this, however, the careers of each man are pre prefigurations of the important protagonists, Pericles and Alcibiades, the latter's career in particular, comprising elements of both Pausanias and Themistocles. Brilliance of strategy, rejection by the people, exile, recall, Persian collusion. Like Alcibiades, Themistocles and Pausanias were rejected by their fellow citizens and turned to Persia. And although Pausanias has no true successor in the surviving narrative, he may have been placed in Book One as a precursor of the Spartan navarch Lysander, who played so important a role in the final years of the Peloponnesian War, and whose later career was very similar to that of Pausanias. Prefiguration and repetition do not apply simply to historical incidents. The opening of Book Six, for instance, commencing anew with the Sicilian expedition, has important structural parallels with the opening of Book One. In both its prefatory material, the Greek archaeology versus Sicilian archaeology, and its articulation of the steps leading to war, speeches by the Spartan allies versus speeches by the Athenians. It also happens that the voices of wise advisors against war, those of Archidamus towards the Spartans and of Nicias towards the Athenians, in each of which similar arguments are reproduced, set the scene for the disasters, Sparta at Pylos, Athens at Syracuse, that are there 
to follow and dominate each of the war's two faces. Thucydides also employs contrast and reversal. We have already mentioned the relation of the Melian dialogue to the Sicilian expedition as an example of juxtaposition, but it serves also to display tragic reversal as the powerful empire that had humbled others is itself humbled with a magnitude that mutatis mutandis is equal. Just as the Melians had been executed to a man, so too the Athenians in Sicily suffered total destruction. To take a different example, even more suggestive, the events at Pylos and Sphacteria have an intimate relationship with the Athenian actions at Syracuse. The former are characterized by Thucydides as, quote, the most unexpected of all those in the war, uh, since the defeat of their forces gave the Spartans their greatest fear. Uh, he mentions this in Book 4, Chapter four, 40, dictating their policy thenceforward to the establishment of peace. Similar, the Athenian defeat at Syracuse is characterized as, quote, the greatest shock to the Athenians and the one which furnished them with their greatest fear and made imperative the reorganization of all their priorities. The narrator himself likens the situation of the Athenians at Sicily with that of the Spartans at Pylos. This, is, this occurs in Book 7, Chapter 71. Occasionally, repetition and reversal occur simultaneously. Once again, the Sicilian narrative furnishes a good example. Thucydides remarks that the Syracusans provided the Athenians with the most difficult type of enemy, one that had the same characteristics as themselves. Within a very short span of time, the Syracusans imitate the Athenians from the section of the Pentaconteitia, that is, in the first 50 years, uh, the 50 year period before, the, uh, in the lead up to the Great Peloponnesian War. And they learned for themselves that naval skill uh, was so important. And it was, the, of course, the naval skill that, the, um, that had previously been Athens' alone. They become Athenians before our very eyes, in other words. And their rise moves step by step with Athenian decline, culminating in the ignominious Athenian retreat and glorious Syracusan victory. The use of narrative patterning in the history is indebted to many predecessors, although not in a simplistic or straightforward way. One obvious influence, of course, is Herodotus. Thucydides' narrative of the Sicilian expedition, for example, follows a pattern used by his predecessor. The richer and more powerful empire, having expanded in other directions, turns its eyes westward, traversing a great distance over land and sea, only to find a lesser power quarrelsome and disunited, making a determined stand, and unbowed by defeat at great odds, ultimately is victorious. Yet the differences are as prominent as the similarities, for Thucydides has taken a motif, that is, greater power comes westward to attack lesser power, but is paradoxically defeated, and uses it to explore a different set of issues than those of Herodotus. Nor is there much doubt that tr the genre of tragedy played an important part in helping Thucydides to give structure and shape to his narrative. It has even been suggested that epic patterning, specifically that of the Odyssey, is at work, with the expedition to Sicily presenting an inverted Homeric pattern, or the lack of homecoming from Sicily, which contrasts strongly with the nostos, that is the homecoming of Odysseus. Some patterns could, of course, have been in Thucydides' mind, yet as with all illusion, the significance uh, must surely be what is reworked, that is, the presence of recognizable elements hewn to a different purpose. It is the integration of epic motifs and tragic structure in the service of quite other interests that makes Thucydides' work so unique. One of the most striking breaks with his predecessor was in Thucydides' narrative manner. I've already mentioned that Herodotus's work featured a largely intrusive narrator, calling attention to his ordering and narration of events. Additionally, Herodotus often gave different versions of events, sometimes preferring one, but more often leaving the matter open. Thucydides, by contrast, 
cut back greatly on the I of his predecessor, while developing a narrative style that portrayed, except in a very few cases, only a single version of events. The reasons for this cannot be known, although one can assume from his famous methodological statement that he himself was satisfied with the level of exactness, acribea, that he had achieved. The process by which he did this, alas, we shall never know. The first person is mainly limited to non-contemporary history, the archaeology, the narratives of Pausanias and Themistocles, the early history of Sicily, and the account of the Tyrannicides. Indeed, both the first and the last of these passages have characteristics of the display piece style that we have already talked about uh, in reference to Herodotus. Uh, the first is something of a sophistic demonstration that the Peloponnesian War was the greatest to that point in time, and the last is part of a polemical passage designed to show that popular tradition was incorrect. Interventions by the narrative, however, are not always tied to the first person. One can see them whenever there is analytical or evaluative language that is not presented as focalized through one of the characters. Even with this category included, however, Thucydidean interventions are uncommon, and it is therefore not surprising that scholars have approached many of them, particularly the extended analyses of Book 2, Chapter 65 on the Athenian leadership uh, after Pericles, and Book 8, Chapters 24 through 5 on the Hean polity and policy as clues to Thucydides' real opinions. A recent analysis, about 25 years ago, has stressed the integration of authorial remarks into the narrative, whereby uh, they help to provide an interpretive framework for the understanding of the narrative. But the presence of such remarks does not preclude the work of reading and deciphering Thucydides' text on its own. The study of narrative technique in Thucydides is rather recent, as I say, but even so, it has already made useful contributions to our understanding of the work. As with Herodotus, I will just simply here give the briefest of overviews. One narrative technique of importance, especially since Thucydides follows a linear narrative, is anachrony. That is, the putting things in uh, uh, order that was not the order in which they happened in time the narration of actions out of their historical order. This is a technique known from other Greek literature, and Thucydides similarly uses it to add drama or to place an item where it lends emphasis, sometimes at crucial moments to the events being narrated. Pericles' death, for example, is noted a year before it occurred, that is in Book 2, Chapter 65, placed just when he has given his realistic evaluation of wartime conditions and what it would take for the Athenians to win the war. His foresight here, compared with his successor's short-sightedness, is the point that is being um, highlighted. Another effective tool for Thucydides is that of iterative presentation, repeating the same things, uh, narrating once what in fact happened many times. Um, this technique allows Thucydides to magnify individual aspects of the war. Um, for example, the plague occurred several times during the war, but its main narration comes only once, and Thucydides combines the individual occurrences into one grand manifestation. A similar technique occurs with the description of civil war in Corsaira. Thucydides says explicitly that such stasis occurred often and elsewhere, but he gives the phenomenon a single locale and a single narration, combining elements from other times and places to bring before the reader the true intensity of the destructive breakdown of society. Conversely, iterative presentation may allow Thucydides to diminish the importance of an action. We are told, for example, only in Book 4, that, Ath that Athenian attacks on the Megarid, that is, the area of Megara, occurred not once, but twice every year until Nisaea was taken, that is, Book 4, Chapter 66, the effect here surely is to diminish the importance of these invasions in a way concordant with Thucydides' consistent minimizing of the role of Megara in bringing about the war. One of the most effective techniques is Thucydides' use of focalization. Ancient literary critics praised Thucydides for his 
energeia, that is his vividness, and part of the ability to portray things as if um, one were really there is to narrate events from the point of view of the participants. One sees this easily enough in the portrayal of character. While not averse to this, to giving judgments in his own voice, the narrator much more often presents evaluations of individuals or states through the eyes of historical actors. Archidamus, for instance, is reputed to be a man of moderation and good sense. Pericles is chosen by the people for his intelligence and reputation. The better element is delighted to see Cleon go to Pylos, where they feel they will be better off either by his victory or his death. The paucity of overt judgments by the narrator himself, especially in comparison with later historians, who routinely included their own evaluations of historical actors, was not a small element in Thucydides' later reputation as an impartial historian. In the actions themselves, the varying of focalization allows the narrator to enter the psychological state of the historical actors, bringing out the immediacy of their feelings and perceptions. This is at least what ancient critics saw. Yet, as the scholar Rood has shown, the use of focalization does much more than lend vividness. It also shows the historical participants in the very act of interpreting events around them, the same task demanded of the reader. And just as importantly, how the perceptions themselves of events contributed to people's response to the situations and choices before them. Thus, Thucydides's use of focalization, like his narrative technique more generally, is intimately connected with his views on the purpose and value of reading history. Few aspects of Thucydides' history have received greater attention than his speeches. Their relationship to historical reality, their purpose in the work itself, their rhetorical structure, and their views of human nature and the ways of nations have all been endlessly analyzed. Even so, here as elsewhere, there is hardly consensus. Nonetheless, the study remains an important one, since the author has accorded them a prominent place in his work. For historians wishing to use them as evidence the problem becomes more acute, since we often learn things in the speeches that are not known from elsewhere. For example, when the Thebans claim that their entire state did not go over to the Persians, that is, kind of betray the Greek cause to the Persians during the Persian Wars, but only a portion of it, this is told to us in Book 3, Chapter 62, is it legitimate to assume that this is historically accurate? Or are they simply saying what they had to say in the circumstances, making the best argument that they could? Or, another example, when Pericles or Cleon tells the Athenians that their empire is a tyranny, book 2, chapter 63, book 3, chapter 37, it is important to know whether they in fact ever did say this, or uh, if they didn't. For if they did say it, it would be crucial to our understanding of Athenian self-definition and identity in the mid-5th century. Our problems begin at the outset, therefore, with the methodological chapter. Um, and I'm going to give a translation here that of a passage that is very vexed in terms of its interpretation. There's a lot of dispute over many of the terms, and interpretation is, in a sense, inevitable. Thucydides says the following, And as for all the things which each said in speech, either when they were about to make war or when they were already in it, it was difficult to remember precisely the exactness of what was said, tain akribeon autain ton lekthendon, both for me regarding the things I heard myself and for those reporting to me at one time or another from elsewhere. But as it seemed to me that each would say especially what was necessary, ta deonta malista, for the given occasion, so it has been written by me holding as closely as possible to the entire argument of the things that were truly said. You may want to pause at this point and just read the whole thing again. As August Groskinski long ago pointed out, the sentence about speeches must be read and interpreted together with the following sentence about deeds with which it has numerous verbal parallels. But even so, 
the problem of interpretation remains. And not surprisingly, it has focused on the meaning of ta deonta, that is, the things necessary, and ksum pasa gnome, that is, um, the entire argument. The former, given what we know of the rhetorical discussions of Thucydides' time, must mean, quote, what was necessary for the business of persuasion, that is, the arguments needed to convince the hearers to adopt the speaker's suggestions. It is more difficult, however, to be certain about the latter. Some scholars have suggested that it means the general purport, but it seems unusual, to say the least, that Thucydides felt he had to hold to that as closely as possible. Dover suggests that a speaker's gnome occupies some point on a scale between the bare imperative for which the speaker argues and the total sequence of argument which he employs. This is indeed sensible, but one ought not to discount the possibility that ksumpasa by itself suggests fullness and completeness, for which a notion of holding as closely as possible seems to me to make sense. So, for example, to take Cleon's speech in the Mytilenean debate, we would define his gnome as abide by your first decision and punish the Mytilenians, but his ksumpasa gnome would be abide by your first decision because it is destructive to change your minds and you will be leaving a bad example for other states, and this is dangerous if, to behave this way if you have an empire, and so forth. In other words, it is not just his opinion, but it is the whole substructure of the argument that underlies his opinion itself. Whatever the case of that may be, the benefit in practice is limited, since Thucydides is not detailing a procedure that can be invoked like a recipe, two parts, what is necessary, one part, entire argument. Rather, he is suggesting a consistently followed method without saying how that method was to be employed in each and every case. In this limited sense, it must be analogous to his procedure with the deeds, for he tells us uh, in the same place that he went through conflicting accounts with a karibea. Yet as with deeds, so with speeches, we do not know how in each and every case the author arrived at his final product. We must presume with some flexibility in the recreation of speeches which allowed the author the necessary license for those events at which he was neither present nor had very good information about what he about what was said the question of the historicity of the speeches long exercised scholars but no real conclusions were ever reached uh given the current state of our evidence it is impossible to prove one way or the other we know also uh really too little of the actual practice of speech making to rule out any of Thucydides' speeches as impossible. To the argument that the speeches are too direct or pointed, one can note the often harsh tone of Greek diplomacy. If the responsions between two or more speeches strain credulity for any given scholar, another will argue that the issues discussed by the characters were clearly those in the air at the time. What seems amazing foreknowledge in some speakers can be explained either as actual prescience on the part of the speaker, since this does sometimes really occur, uh, or, again, as matters that were planned at the time, even if they were not implemented until later. Even the distinction between the particular situation of a speech and the general principles invoked by the speaker may not be a reliable guide. The scholar Hammond, for example, has examined this specific versus universal dichotomy in several of the speeches and concludes that the generalized portions of the speeches are likely to be Thucydides' own invention, that is, his application of the principle of ta deonta, the things necessary, whereas the particularized arguments uh, seem to have been based on the situation of the moment, that, uh, which are likely to be those actually given at the time in, in historical reality. Um. Hammond would also see the, propos the proportion varying with the ability of Thucydides to actually learn of the contents of the speeches. So those of generals, the speeches of generals who then die in battle, are likely to have been much more invented and therefore universalized than those which were made in an assembly at which Thucydides was likely to have been present. 
All of these things might indeed be true, but caution is definitely in order. The argument from probability, for example, of which we have numerous examples in the Attic orators, often proceeds from the universal to the specific, and often uses the universal as evidence to demonstrate the specific. Thucydides's abstractions and antitheses can also be paralleled in the oratory of the day. Conversely, it is just as easy, if one is familiar with the background of events, as Thucydides was, to invent specific arguments that might have been, or as he would say, must have been, made at the time. This dichotomy, therefore, of specific and universal ought not to be employed with any confidence, uh, at least any confidence that it can help us to discern the actual from the invented. Since the arguments for and against historicity seem to have led nowhere, it is not surprising that scholars seen little, um, um, uh, seen little or um, um, benefit to this have turned their attention elsewhere. Um, it is clear, for example, that placement and selection of speeches play an important role. And it is reasonable to assume that Thucydides had a purpose in setting out the speeches as he did. Regardless of their historicity, Thucydides made innumerable choices about which speeches he would include in the narrative and how and at what length he would present them. There are often opposing pairs of speeches, particularly when some major decision or issue of policy is being highlighted. The debate at Athens over Corsaira, for instance, Book 1, Chapters 32 through 43. The Congress of Allies at Sparta, Book 1, Chapters 68 through 78. The Fates of Plataea or Mytilene, Book 3, Chapters 37 through 48. The debate at Sicily, Book 6, Chapters 33 through 41. Thucydides will often give the speeches before a battle of opposing generals, similarly, but the number and nature of these varies. At other points, however, where we may have expected a pair of opposing speeches because of what we perceive as an important occasion, there is but a single speech. And in those cases, it is legitimate to ask what Thucydides' artistic aims were in choosing such a procedure. Although we might have thought that the issue of going to war was an important one, there is no opposing speech to that of Pericles in Book One, in which he urges the Athenians not to make peace with Sparta. When the Spartans sue for peace as a result of the disaster at Sphacteria, they are given a lengthy speech at Athens in direct discourse, full of reflections on the past and the future, while Cleon's advice to the assembly is given briefly in indirect discourse, as simply a series of demands. Within the speeches themselves, selection and arrangement are of crucial importance. As Colin McLeod has pointed out, the speeches in Thucydides do not simply try to mirror their counterparts in real life, but are rather rhetorically ideal equivalents to the actual wording. Thucydides is making not an actual speech, but the image of a speech. And whereas the original speaker's purpose was to persuade his audience, Thucydides's purpose is to show us how and why they succeeded or failed, to help us understand and also to judge the speaker and his public. It is precisely because of this that we cannot use the speeches as reproductions, either more or less faithful to what was actually said. This is not to deny that Thucydides at times does reproduce some of the actual arguments that may have been used. In many cases, he must have done exactly that. But the orientation and the shape of the speech, especially in what it puts in and what it takes out, what it emphasizes and what it de-emphasizes, are all the work of the author such that our impressions and understandings of a speaker, whether an individual like Pericles, Brasidas, or Hermocrates, or a collective such as the Athenians, or the Corinthians, or um, the Plataeans, um, these are all directly dependent upon the historians and not the original speaker's words. To put it simply, selection and arrangement already carry with them interpretation. It is not a question of mendacity, we are all familiar with the phenomenon of taking away different things from the same speech. Uh, it is rather that the historian focuses on the things that he has decided are important and conducive to a proper interpretation or to the proper interpretation. The careful responsion between logoi and erga, that is words and deeds, which permeate Thucydides' text, 
suggests that the historian is in each case sifting through individual elements of both in order to assign to both deeds and words some coherent and intelligible structure that they lack in the untidy and um, apparatic world of reality. In this sense, with or without original arguments, the speeches are Thucydides's own. The speeches encompass the three subgenres of oratory as the ancients defined them. There is but one epideictic speech that is display oratory, namely Pericles' funeral oration of Book 2, chapters 35 through 46. Uh, and this answers both the characterization of Athens made by the Corinthians in Book 1, chapters 68 through 71, and the characterization of the Spartans made by Archidamus in Book 1, chapters 80 through 85. Whether or not it was composed after the war, it is an epitaphios, that is a funeral oration for Athens herself, at least the Athens of the 5th century. Um, there are two what are known as forensic speeches, or uh, legal speeches in a sense, both given at the fall of Plataea, that of the P Plataeans in their own defense in Book 3, chapters 53 through 9, and the Thebans' prosecutorial response in Book 3, chapters 61 through 67. The vast majority of speeches, however, are uh, what are known as symboleotic or speeches giving counsel, um, addresses to civic bodies that are considering the course of events and are being uh, uh, and that are used to urge either the following of one particular course of action or another. These speeches are carefully constructed distillations of the immediate and long-term issues faced by the historical participants. The recurrent topics, justice and expediency, action and inaction, ruling or being ruled, experience and challenge, growth and safety, they all serve as elements of unification, allowing the reader to perceive the persistence of the significant issues as Thucydides saw them. However, these may have changed in individual manifestations, that is, in the historical context as the war progressed. This is true even of the speeches of the generals before battles. In these speeches, the immediacy of the situation brings into starker relief what is at stake. Yet even here, we find elements of analysis and interpretation that go beyond the immediate situation and lend continuity of theme to the work. In the speech of Pagandas to the Boeotians before the Battle of Delium in four, Book 4, Chapter 92, the general spends most of his time explaining to his men their reasons for fighting the Athenians and the consequences of failing to do so. It is full of the sorts of generalizations abstracted from the situation at hand that characterize many of the speeches in Thucydides. At the end, Pagondas reminds them of their previous victories, encouraging them by saying that the sacrifices have been favorable and the god is assuredly on their side since they are defending his temple. The speech thus assists the reader in understanding the strategic issues at stake, which all suggest possible outcomes should the Boeotians fail to act. And all this all provides a summary of the strategy that informed the Boeotians' decision to act. Although the majority of the speeches in Thucydides deal with public policy and elucidate decisions and strategies, a small number of isolated dicta or brief conversations are also reported. They are greatly reduced from the number in Herodotus, so they are noteworthy when they occur, and perhaps surprisingly, many appear at moments of great pathos. When open hostilities are about to commence, the Athenians refuse to allow the Spartan herald Melissippus to address their assembly, and he is escorted to the border where he only utters a single line, prophetically stating that this day will be the beginning of great evils for the Greeks. In another incident, a herald, this time of the Embratiates, comes to the Arcananians to ask permission to take up the dead from the recent battle. His slow recognition that an army of reinforcements had also been destroyed in the battle is brought out in brief dialogue with an unnamed Arcananian. When he realizes the extent of the destruction, his reaction is thoroughly Herodotian. He says, quote, when he heard and understood that the force from the city had been destroyed, he cried out, and struck by the magnitude of their present sufferings, immediately departed, not having accomplished his mission, and he no longer was demanding the bodies. End quote. One other 
is a dictum of the Spartan prisoner from Sphacteria who was ridiculed for surviving and not fighting to the death like his fellow soldiers. When asked if the ones who had died were the Kaloi Kagathoi, that is, the fair and brave, he responded that arrows would be worth a great deal if they could pick out brave men from cowards. Finally, I should say a word about Thucydides' ascription of motives or intentions to his historical characters. These are speeches of a sort, since the character expresses his thoughts through words. To put it simply, it is impossible to know how Thucydides proceeded in this matter, nor do we, as with the speeches, have a methodological chapter that we can debate. However, perhaps the procedure was akin to that of the speeches, a mixture of what they actually thought, where this could have been discovered, with a reasonable inference of what they must have thought. Here, of course, the issue is complicated by the fact that spoken words have addressees who might hear and remember them, whereas thoughts and intentions are often private. It is possible, for example, that some Athenians who survived in Sicily remembered Nicias's second speech before the battle in the harbor, in which he called upon his captains by tribe and patronymic and urged them on with extremely traditional sentiments. But which of them could have known the sequence of thought that Thucydides gives as Nicias's reasons for delivering his second speech in Book 7, Chapter 69, or Nicias's belief that the speech uh, I'm sorry, uh, his Nicias belief after the speech that he thought he had spoken not what was suitable, but what was necessary, Book 7, Chapter 69. Not surprisingly, therefore, scholars have suggested that Thucydides often did not know what the motives for actions were, and he simply read them back from the results of the actions themselves. Such a procedure would be neither surprising nor dishonest, and it is practiced still today by historians who must use imaginative rec recreation, recreation to connect the dots of individual actions into a narrative with direction, movement, and coherence. Like the Iliad of Homer, the history of Thucydides portrays a world at war, and like the, the Homeric epic, it seeks also to portray the world in war. Whereas Herodotus's history had aspired to a universality by its inclusiveness, its treatment of many nations and behaviors, as well as its concern with all areas of human endeavor, great and marvelous deeds. Thucydides, by contrast, sought universality by narrowing the focus of history and simultaneously using that narrowed focus as the means for an extended meditation on power, suffering, and the human condition. As for Homer, so for Thucydides, his war was the supreme ergon, the supreme deed, and through it he could say all that he wanted to about the human condition. An earlier generation of scholars saw in Thucydides' work the embodiment of real politique, an unflinching portrait of the harsh realities of intrastate and interstate relations, and in this saw Thucydides' contribution to explaining how the world works. There are good grounds for doing this, of course, since Thucydides' narrative is much, perhaps even mainly, concerned with force and imperialism, reason and necessity. But such an approach runs the risk of being one-dimensional and antithetical to Thucydides' work. He was, after all, concerned with ta anthropina, that is, human affairs, and not ta polemica, that is, military affairs only. And there is a great deal more in the history than war and imperialism. Uh, to put it in a different way, war and imperialism are about much more than even themselves. And it is through them that Thucydides examines other issues, not least the importance of, of power, wealth, preparedness, judgment, chance or the unexpected, and the individual in his community, and the interrelationship of speech and action. These are all major themes of his work. From the archaeology of the opening chapters onwards, a main concern of Thucydides is, is with wealth, provisions, and preparedness, with money or tribute and its consequences. Archidamus, at the outset, says that waging war is a matter of money, chapter one, ver uh, sorry, book one, chapter 83, and the issue never falls far below the surface. The resources of especially Athens allow her to behave in a way different from and greater than all previous empires. 
Her wealth was not stagnant, but dynamic, used to finance a navy that perpetual that perpetuated national expansion, and she could use wealth to acquire yet more. The splendor with which the Athenian armament sets out for Sicily in the fall of 415 is the visible embodiment of that underlying wealth. It would be wrong to focus exclusively on money, however, since a city's preparedness for war included men and materiel. Thucydides says that both Athens and Sparta went into the war at the height of their parascoe, that is the height of their preparation. This is book one, chapter one. And the Spartans, short on money but long on stability and bravery in battle, are able to prevent Athens from growing yet greater during the war and, of course, are able eventually to defeat her. Money and preparedness belong to the realm of human endeavor that proceeds from rational calculation. There can be no doubt that Thucydides <clears throat> excuse me, appreciated the importance of intelligence and foresight, gnome, ronoia, and that he ascribes these characteristics to certain individuals in the history. Themistocles, for instance, Pericles, Brasidas, Hermocrates, and more problematically, Nicias. The ability to understand events and to take action concordant with that perception mark out the truly great statesmen from everyone else. Such figures appear only at certain intervals, and their effect can be of long standing. Themistocles' foresight in making Athens a naval power had far-reaching consequences. So too Pericles had correctly foreseen not only the superior advantages that Athens possessed, but also how they should be employed to reach the goal of victory. But foresight, no matter how keen, must always run into the element of the unexpected. From the initial warning of Archidamus in Book 1, Chapter 78, to the observations of the Spartans at Pylos, Book 4, Chapter 18, from the Melians, Hope, in Book 5, Chapter 102, to the Athenians' Despair, in Book 7, Chapter 61, the elements of the unforeseen in war, chance, and, the, and that which is contrary to expectation, to paradoxon, are all consistently sketched. Foresight and chance have a complex relationship. When intelligence guides chance, or adapts its original intention to it, as Pericles does when the Athenians suffer from the unexpected plague, some opportunity for mastering it exists. Where it is not subject to intelligence and rational interpretation like the eclipse at Syracuse, breakdown and disaster occur. Thus, the, the unexpected requires, paradoxically, that human beings demonstrate good foresight, and chance, far from freeing men to behave as they wish, requires them requires of them more than anything else a firm reliance on intelligent decision making the spartans say as much when they suggest to the athenians that to make peace and good fortune would be to win a reputation both for success and sagacity how nations react therefore to what is unexpected reveals important aspects of their character and the longer the war goes on the more all of the participants are subject to chance Chance and the unexpected are important as well in two related areas. First, in contributing, contributing to the theme of suffering, and the second, in emphasizing the gulf between expectation and achievement. Thucydides was considered by ancient critics to be the best at depicting emotion, and nowhere is this truer than in the sufferings encountered by the participants in the war. At first, it is primarily the main participants, Athens and Sparta. But as the war goes on, greater numbers of people suffer, as they either choose or are forced to become involved in the conflict. Thucydides says in the preface that the war was the greatest upheaval, not only for the participants, but also for the greater part of the Hellenic world, and some portion of the non-Greek world too. This is Book 1, Chapter 1. So although the war begins at Athens and her allies against Sparta and her allies, as time goes on, new alliances are attempted or established. States hitherto uninvolved suddenly call in the great powers of Athens and Sparta, and the civil discord that was always a feature of Greek history becomes exacerbated and even more destructive. Now whole parties can be destroyed, thanks to the greater might of the ruling powers. Where earlier scholars once once emphasized Thucydides' detachment from affairs, recent work, by contrast, has called attention to how profoundly involved uh, 
he was with the sufferings brought about by the conflicts of the great powers. War for Thucydides uh, is, as it had been for Homer, the testing ground. And the disasters of war, no less than its triumphs, are the historian's concern. Under such extreme conditions, the baser impulses of human behavior assert themselves. We can call to witness the stasis in Corsaira. But so do the nobler impulses. Witness the Sicilians' ability to submerge their differences and unite in defeating Athens, for example. Thucydides' consistent use of superlatives highlights the element of suffering and makes us, with the characters, participants in the emotional seesaw of war. The description, the description of the plague, for example, has a portion of detached observations on the symptoms, but a much more highly charged portrait of the consequences of the illness on Athenian society at the time. Even Pericles must acknowledge the sufferings brought about by his own policy. And the historian retains the eye for endurance so people, um, great and small, whether it be in the distant embraciates who endure the greatest disasters in the time or the Athenian armada at Sicily, can see their own sufferings that are drawn out by their own actions, uh, by their own delay, and by chance. The element of the unexpected and unpredictable also creates a gulf between human aspirations and human achievement. It marks out as an essentially irrational experience, uh, that, that war itself is an essentially irrational experience. Men plan to the best of their ability, but the result is rarely as they would wish. Um, the scholar Parry saw this gulf in terms of logos and ergon, a dichotomy that permeates the history, as I've already said. But for Parry, logos represents all manner of intellectual apprehension and understanding, including foresight and judgment. He argues that Athens under Pericles was the single occasion where logos and ergon were perfectly fused, and largely because Pericles was able to create a political order based on an intelligent perception, this was the case. With the loss of Pericles, however, Athens and the larger Greek world decline, such that words and deeds are now separate entities, and human intelligence no longer has control. Other scholars, too, have been concerned with speech and action, with planning and as results. Stahl, for instance, like Parry, sees speech as that part of human experience that uses calculation and forethought before action. What Stahl emphasizes by contrast, however, is that there is always in Thucydides a difference between intention and reality, between what participants plan for to happen and what actually does. Even those generally agreed to have foresight never see exactly how things will work out. But Archidamus in Attica and Formio in the Corinthian Gulf find their carefully calculated actions leading to results that they did not indeed uh, foresee, nor could they have foreseen. And in these moments, it is often the irrational that comes to the fore and motivates men to action. This tragic gap between aspiration and achievement, between what men expect to happen and what actually happens, permeates Thucydides' history. Stahl also argues that erga, deeds, must be read in light of logoi, that is, words or mental actions. For if we look at a speech in the context of preceding and following events, we can infer Thucydides' judgments of those speakers. And more importantly, we can understand the success of moods and reflections of human beings who face the contingencies of war. Stahl's analysis of the speeches of Nicias and Alcibiades in Book Six, in the light of the later Sicilian expedition, argues that it was Nicias who correctly foresaw events, and the narrative plays up exactly those variables, Sicilian unity, money, cavalry, that Nicias had foreseen as crucial. In this way, the narrative retrospectively gives judgment on the two participants, and by extension, the Athenians who voted for the expedition. This is a very brief overview that I've just given, and it hardly gives a sense of the depth and complexity of Thucydides' work. These issues will, of course, continue to be debated and analyzed, even if we did have the ending of Thucydides' work, an element that would have been essential in the interpretation of the text, there is no reason to assume that Thucydides would have more easily pointed the way to interpretation. That task he leaves to the reader. Many of the recent works of scholarship reflect 
the complexity and open-endedness of the process, the way in which one re-examines the text as one re-experiences it. They do not seek a single-minded Thucydides, nor one divorced from his contemporaries, even if his approach may have differed from theirs. On the contrary, Thucydides was profoundly concerned with the interplay between individual and state and between competing states. He recognized the strong and almost indefinable links between human judgment and human suffering, between what was and what might have been, and how close the difference was between the two. Ancient critics, as I've already mentioned, considered Herodotus the historian as, as the historian of character. Thucydides was the historian of emotion. To be sure, Thucydides' characterization lacks the eye for detail that is so much a part of Herodotus, and he does not often provide the mark of individualism that distinguishes a particular person from a type. His work is interested in processes rather than personalities. Nevertheless, he would be wrong, I'm sorry, it would be wrong to say that Thucydides has no interest in character. He is aware that it plays an important role in history. What is significant in Thucydides is that character is sketched within the context of the individual's role in his community, such that the qualities that are defined and portrayed are those which people display in a public arena. Because that interplay is Thucydides' real interest, there is little time spent on private or purely personal qualities. We are alerted to the importance of individuals early on in the excurses on Pausanias and Themistocles, Yet it is in it, it is the Themistocles' public qualities, foresight, adaptability, and good judgment that are on display, just as more negatively it is Pausanias' adoption of foreign ways that has a direct consequence for Spartan leadership in the aftermath of the Persian Wars. The individual who dominates the early books and whose shadow stretches over all the remaining ones is, of course, Pericles. Whatever Thucydides thought of Athens, he must certainly thought have thought its ideal ruler was Pericles, for he alone in the history has the power both of understanding and of action. It is he who is able to harness the good qualities of the Athenians to a fixed and admirable purpose. He best knows their character and best knows how to encourage or dissuade them from action. He occupies a position of predominance based on consent. The uncharacteristically lengthy evaluation of Pericles and his successors in Book 2, Chapter 65, highlights the personal qualities that won for Pericles the trust of the demos, his understanding and incorruptibility, combined with a certain respect for the people themselves. But it also emphasizes how he put those qualities to the service of his state, such that the people were willing to entrust their affairs to him. It has rightly been said that all of his successors fail in one way or the other. Either they have his respectable personal qualities but are unable to put them into action, or they are able managers of public affairs while lacking his ethical core. What is essential for the drama and movement of Thucydides' history, however, is the existence of national characters. And before I look into that quality of specific individuals, it is necessary first to say something about what I mean here national characters. The notion of national characters is introduced by the Corinthians in their speech urging the Spartans to war, where they make an extended comparison between Athenians and Spartans, always to the latter's a disadvantage. The Athenians are daring, resourceful, acquisitiveness, resi acquisitive, resilient, and energetic. The Spartans, by contrast, are slow, hesitant, defensively minded. The narrator himself endorses this evaluation much more in Book 8, where he calls the Spartans, quote, the most helpful enemies the Athenians could have had, since their hesitancy played directly into Athenian hands. Although the Spartans do show initiative occasionally in the war, this is always the result of an extraordinary individual, Brasidas, for instance, in the Arcadamian period of the war, Alcibiades in the latter parts of the war. When Brasidas dies and when Alcibiades goes back to the Athenian side and maneuvers with the Persians, the Spartans revert to their true nature, that of waiting and reacting. And yet, being slow and steady, they have the advantage of, avoid, of avoiding the excesses of the Athenians, not for them 
massive expeditions that end in utter destruction, not for them the tyrant's life, with all the dangers attendant on ruling others. Thucydides hints at their stability already at the, in the archaeology, and he refers to it again. When he notes that the Chians were the only ones after the Lacedaemonians to have good fortune and a sense of moderation, he is he is intimating, uh, that is in book 8, chapter 24, he is picking up a, uh, a little seed that he had laid already in the very beginning of the work in the archaeology. This fundamental discrepancy between the two major players explains something of the tilt of Thucydides' work. For although the subject is properly the war of the Athenians and the Spartans, and Thucydides is careful to focalize events from both sides, it is the Athenians who are the prime motivators of the work, and it is their fortunes and failures that are centrally placed. For much of the time, indeed most of the narrative, they goad the Spartans to action. It is fear of them that compels Sparta to embark on the Archidamian War, and it is Athenian action in Sicily that brings them back into the field against Athens. It can hardly be doubted, indeed, uh, it seems self-evident, that Thucydides's attitude to Athens was not simple. The man who could pen the funeral oration was hardly oblivious to his city's accomplishments, and yet he must surely have realized on the pragmatic level that he could never have written such a history of Sparta. It is Ath uh, it is Athens' leaders and Athens' demos that make history. And Pericles says as much when he observes, ironically it turns out, that the Athenians have no need of a Homer for their panegyrist, since, they ha since their eternal glory lay in the extent of their empire. The transformation of character that attends the Athenians in Sicily is carefully drawn, and their movement from daring and enterprising to fearful and passive grows greater as Book 7 progresses. In the end, the Athenians refuse to board their ships to fight the Syracusans, even though they still have the advantage in numbers. It is a scene, in its way, as shocking as the Spartan surrender at Pylos, since in both cases a people behave completely out of character. Yet one must remember that these Athenians are only a portion of the people, and when the narrative returns to Athens, the full demos is resolved despite the massive destruction, not to give in. The eighth book, in particular, shows the adaptability of the Athenians, now in quite another way. They will, it seems, do anything to win the war, even if it means changing their government or allying with their enemy Persia, even if it means accepting the traitorous Alcibiades. Moved from the Iliadic qualities of active heroism, the Athenians in the latter stages of the war display Odyssean guile and endurance. It is against this backdrop of national characteristics that the individuals of the history must be viewed. From many examples, three will suffice for our brief uh, overview right now. Brasidas does not long occupy the stage of history, but he makes up in achievement what he lacks in longevity. He is thoroughly unspartan in his actions, preferring not simply to long for the prisoners from Sphacteria, but instead determined to take the war to the Athenians on their own terms. Like Pericles, he displays foresight in that he sees the winning over of potential allies as the very thing that can bring the Athenians to the bargaining table. And like earlier heroes, he has the ability to make his deeds match his words. He gives several speeches in which his qualities as a commander and as an astute political force come to the fore. Not only is he able to marshal his men against overwhelming odds, he can also, by a combination of persuasion and threat, win over the cities of the north. Thucydides, in keeping with the perspective that I've already mentioned, delineates his character as it affects his political activity and the, and the course of the war. His influence is felt not only in the immediate actions in which he directly participates, but also proleptically, that is, and with a sense of anticipation, uh, since Thucydides claims in Book 4, Chapter 81, that it was Brasidas's good reputation that led the cities later in the battles after Sicily to accept Spartan leadership. Like Pericles, Brasidas cast a shadow beyond his own time. Daring, resourceful, even eloquent at times, he raises the question of what the war might have been like had the Spartans been more similar to the Athenians. And in the manner of his heroic death, he embodies the patriotic spirit 
of one devoted to Hasidim. The dominant Athenian of the second part of the history, at least as far as the narrative extends, is Nicias, and his personal journey from success and good fortune to destruction and death mirrors the movement of the Athenians as the war progresses. He appears twice during the Arcadian War, once in a minor campaign against Minoa, and once in the major action at Pylos, where his good fortune is played out in action. He, his delayed introduction, however, occurs during negotiations for peace, and he is there sketched as one distinguished by his good fortune. And he is eager to maintain it by not unnecessarily running risks. We read this in Book 5, Chapter 16. This immediately sets up a tension between his character and that of the Athenians, which will be played out in tragic fashion in the narrative that follows. Since when Nicias argues that a good citizen thinks first of his own person, he has already reversed the relationship of citizen to city sketched out by Pericles, and hints at a dangerous tendency to care too much for his own reputation. In the Sicilian debate, he plays the role of wise advisor for a time, Yet unlike Herodotus and wise advisers, Nicias has a hand in bringing to pass the very disasters of which he warned. By a tragic combination of unAthenian reluctance and unPericlean concern for his own reputation, he manages to bring a great force to nothing. Unable, unable to harness and drive the national character of the Athenians, he unwittingly becomes its victim and is dragged to destruction. Yet even this is somewhat simplified, since the Athenians wished him to be the commander and refused to remove him, even when he was incapacitated. So much had they pinned on his reputation, indeed for good fortune and his lucky name, that they refused to allow him to leave his post. Having warned the Athenians not to hope for victory in Sicily, he himself becomes the carrier of that hope and he embodies this complex interplay of reasonable calculation and unreasonable hope that characterizes the expedition itself. For much of the latter part of the history, he is in explicit or implicit rivalry with Alcibiades. Thucydides gives more details of Alcibiades' private life and demeanor than of any other character in the history. The reason for this is probably not, as has been supposed, an increasing interest in personality as the history progresses, but rather a recognition that Alcibiades' personal traits had a considerable, one might even say, defining importance for the Athenians and for the course of the war. Thucydides had said that private interests were what destroyed the state after the death of Pericles, and Alcibiades proved, so to speak, the truth of this remark. Too much a lover of his own status and of his own image, he is too little the patriot, Although due credit is given for his abilities as a general, he nevertheless contributes to Athenian demoralization by encouraging the Sicilian expedition and by later exhorting the Spartans to prosecute the war vigorously. By wishing to be the first man in democracy, in, 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 his, in the democracy, by embodying the traits of a tyrant, he throws into disarray the careful relationship of leader and led that had been the hallmark of Periclean rule. Where the, that earlier leader had respected the people's rights and the established order, Alcibiades finds fault with the democracy and is content to overturn it. If it should mean that he has primacy, then he is willing to do that. Indeed, Phrynichus's remark that democracy and oligarchy were all the same to Alcibiades is echoed, echoed in a rare authorial judgment. Alcibiades, in this way, and his own person represents the type of destructive personal rivalries that Thucydides thought were responsible for Athens' defeat, as again he says in Book 2, Chapter 65. We may say, then, that although characters in Thucydides are not depicted with the painterly precision of a Plutarch, say, they are nevertheless individualized in the context of the larger issues of the war. And Thucydides adds a further element of individuation, by employing slightly different speaking styles for certain individuals. For example, Tompkins's analysis of the Sicilian debate between Nicias and Alcibiades shows that the structure and language of the two men are clearly distinct. Each speaker displays certain mannerisms, and each has a distinctive sentence structure. 
Lysias preferring syntactical complication, while Alcibiades prefers paratactic construction and a simple speaking style. Other scholars have pointed out that Brasidas likewise has a distinctive style, using words that often have a Homeric or poetic coloring, while retaining a contemporary liking for abstract nouns. Conversely, Archidamus, as befits a man of the old school, avoids such nouns, together with what might be considered the other modern touches of verbal play, irony, antithesis, and sentence complexity. There may also be characterization of peoples. Certain topics and arguments, for example, are found only in speeches by Athenians, while there is some evidence that the Thebans too speak in a distinctive way. This awareness then that Thucydides and his individuation may, uh, may be below rather than on the surface suggests future directions that might profitably contribute to an understanding of characterization in his work. Now, Roughly 120 years ago or so, or let's just say over a century ago, um, as we've outlined already, the major um, assumption among uh, scholars of Thucydides was that he was a very accurate historian and that he could be trusted and his, uh, uh, and his reliability was essentially unquestioned. Uh, now, that assumption would be maintained really until i would say uh, up until about the last 50 years or so uh, uh, 50, 50 years ago or so when thucydides reliability although virtually unquestioned was occasionally uh challenged such as by collingwood or cornford uh, but in the last 50 years that has changed if the balance has changed today it is not though because much new evidence has come to light. Rather, the movement away from seeing Thucydides as an objective historian to one deeply involved in the events he narrates has suggested that the deeds themselves bear the imprint of his mind. The recognition that Thucydides used rhetorical means to effect his point has tempered absolute faith in his narrative. At the same time, a new appreciation of the complexity of historical narrative has allowed the debate to move beyond the black and white interpretation, which sees only truth or lies. There are various categories under which Thucydides' reliability has often been questioned, and it is helpful to look at some of them uh, now uh, in our own talk. No careful reader is likely to miss Thucydides' penchant for magnification. Events are said to be the greatest, the biggest, the most glorious, the most destructive, or the most shocking, as the occasion warrants, a tendency thought to be at odds with sober factual reporting. Um, it becomes an issue of reliability, really, if the desire to magnify leads the author to overstate or to generalize, as he does in his description of the plague, for instance. Additionally, Thucydides' recurrent use of the motif in which every form of suffering, contrivance, or the like occurs, and suggesting both magnification and a level of generalization somewhat at odds with the recording of distinct and individual actions. Others have found suspicious his nick of time narratives, as when the second Athenian ship to Mytilene arrives just as... Um, uh, the decree is being read out uh, that will um, basically annihilate that entire city, uh, and it is just getting ready to be put into action. Um, or when Gongylus sneaks into Syracuse just when negotiations for surrender are being discussed. Outright errors, though, are rare in the cities, but they do occur. There are several topographical mistakes the best known of which is the width of the sea between Sphacteria and the mainland. Thucydides is almost certainly wrong that the Athenians had always buried their war dead in the Keramikos, except for those who died at Marathon, because an inscription concerning the expenses of the... Uh, uh, well, th that, is, that is a fact that is brought out by modern-day archaeology. Um, and, uh, and actually, this was, this was pointed out even by uh, many years ago by Felix Jacobi in his article... Patrios Nomos, State Burial in Athens and the Public Cemetery in the Karamaikos, if you'd like to look into that. Um, uh, 
An inscription concerning the expenses of the squadron sent to Corsaira in 433 seems to record different names and, uh, and, and the number of the generals sent as reinforcements from those given by Thucydides. Additionally, another inscription relating to the Sicilian expedition seems to suggest that the command was originally given to one general, not three. Scholars still weigh such discrepancies differently, and the presence of error by itself does not vitiate what remains, especially since it is difficult to attach any attempt to deceive to those particular errors. But they ought also to remind us that there is no ground for the belief in a superhuman standard of accuracy practiced by Thucydides. As I've noted before, the role that repetition plays in the structuring of his incidents, and also how Logos and Aragon form complementary units for interpretation. Both of these features have been used by scholars to argue against the reliability of Thucydides' history, because repetition arouses suspicion that the individuality or discrete separateness of events has been either ignored or minimized. Additionally, the desire to impose patterns may have caused the historian to manipulate data. Such an approach is taken by Hunter in her tellingly entitled book, Thucydides, the Artful Reporter. Hunter analyzes the interplay between both Logoi and Erga and argues that the careful way in which certain Logoi exactly anticipate the Erga that follow suggests a historian manipulating the data of history for an ulterior purpose. She argues also that the combination of patterning and cumulative knowledge gained from previous examples, uh, which she calls paradigma or paradigmata, enables the reader to learn from the examples of others, just as some characters in the work learn from the past. Thucydides was thus concerned above all to depict cycles of histories of history at the central point of which is a change in fortune, a metabole. The wise reader learns how to recognize the cycle and is even able to predict what will happen when societies overstep their bounds. Thucydides selected all of his facts with a view towards bringing out these patterns, and that explains the selectiveness and omission of much of what we would like to have been uh, included. Thucydides thus was no scientist in the 19th century sense, and if objective means not to allow one's own outlook, philosophical or otherwise uh, viewpoint to obtrude, then Thucydides was surely the least objective of historians. That is a direct quote from Hunter. Leaving aside the question of what objectivity in a historian would look like, I can note that the harmony between Logos and Ergon is not quite so complete. Hunter does show these aspects um, where, where speech and action do harmonize or where they lead to learning through experience. And these, of course, are important. But as Stahl and Pelling have demonstrated, even the wisest of counselors misjudge future events. Many of Nicias's predictions about Sicily do come true. But this coexists in the narrative with the palpable sense that different actions were possible and might have led to different results. While not denying the manipulation of data, we note also that Thucydides is consistently complicating matters for the reader by showing the intertwining of expectation, informed action, irrational behavior, and chance that make up the decisive elements and actions of history. The lessons seem neither clear nor tidy. Finally, omissions, although these are of two kinds, all exist. The first are those that can be detected from Thucydides' own account, from references by the narrator to events which he himself has not narrated. At Book 4, Chapter 50, for example, Thucydides mentions previous embassies to Persia, or at Book 7, Chapter 11, Nicias indicates that he has written previous letters to the Athenians, yet neither the embassies nor the letters were mentioned before. This first type of omission is best explained in terms of narrative strategy, or of the author's criteria of relevance. The second type of omission is detected by comparison of Thucydides' account with other contemporary or slightly later texts, literary or inscriptional. Now Thucydides' criterion for inclusion was, as with Herodotus, that which he considered worthy of account, 
Material included thus conforms to what the author thinks important. Yet to argue that what Thucydides leaves out is what he thought unimportant is little more than a tautology. We must confront directly what Thucydides chose to ignore. The classic examples of the Peace of Callias in 445, which find no mention in the Pentecontitia, or from the time of the war itself, the raising of the tribute in 425, an action which may have made the cities of the Chalcidice readier to accept Brasidas's offers, cannot simply be waved away. There is also Thucydides' lack of concern with religion, an element that was, as we know from other sources, prominent in the prosecution of the war. Some think he also minimized the importance of Persia in the narrative of the earlier years of the war. Not surprisingly, defenses of these omissions are often provided. One can argue that the peace of Callias had no influence on the war of Athenian power, the growth of Athenian power, which was the theme of the Pentecost idea, or that the raising of the tribute was unimportant to the course of the war, or was never effectively collected, or that since Thucydides was concerned with ta anthropina, that is human affairs, religion has, as such, clearly had no place. However, the point may be what we have learned elsewhere, that Thucydides's work is a highly individualistic, yet carefully integrated work, emphasizing the same few themes that were most important to him. What he leaves out, that is, what we would have him put in, shows how very differently we would write a history of the Peloponnesian War today, and that in turn should remind us of the gulf between Thucydides's conception of narrative history and our own. Just as importantly, the story that we would write would thus become a different story from that of Thucydides. Rude's pointed remark about Thucydides' depiction of Athens is true of the work as a whole. He says, quote, we cannot disprove it, we can tell different stories, end quote. Now, in terms of Thucydides' afterlife, a full and up-to-date treatment of Thucydides' influence is uh, a strong desideratum. That is something that we do not have, a big lacuna in modern scholarship. For no historian had a more immediate or more lasting impact on Greek historiography than he did. His immediate influence is seen in the fact that three, or perhaps four, historians of the next generation continued his history from the place where it broke off in the year 411. And once he inaugurated the tradition of contemporary historiography, no era of Greek history ever lacked chroniclers. The Sicilian historian Philistus of Syracuse carefully imitated Thucydides in his work, going so far as to leave his history like Thucydides is unfinished. The legacy of Thucydides can be seen in Polybius's stringent criteria for the proper writing of history with its echoes of Thucydidean methodology and phrases. And in the empire, he was uh, a model for Josephus, Herodian, Dexippus, and others, his influence extending well into the Byzantine era. And in the Roman tradition, his influence is most clearly seen in Sallust. Literary critics considered Thucydides a master of the grand style and teachers of oratory saw his work as valuable for lending power and emphasis to speeches. His ability to arouse strong emotions and his gift for visual narration meant that his history had use even for those not interested in its historical content. For historians, on the other hand, he proved the ultimate model, the writer who had most perfectly blended the historical uh, individual and the historical universal, and had clothed it with a difficult but memorable language. His biographer Marcellinus was no doubt echoing the judgment of many earlier critics and perhaps the historian himself when he noted that Thucydides was an emulator of Homer. In artistic arrangement, emotional depth, and moral outlook, he equaled that great poet. His boast that he created a possession for all time is at bottom a poet's claim of immortality. It must have seemed boastful to contemporaries, but to posterity it has proved a truism. Thank you.